Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. And thanks to our virtual audience for watching yet another Poison Pen event. Tonight, we're having a wonderful time welcoming Kate Alice Marshall. Isn't that right? Sorry, it was the drink that threw me. <laughs> We've been over at the Valley Ho in the bar, so, you know, it throws me slightly. Anyway, um, and her wonderful book, What Lies in the Woods, which is our January Crime Collector's Book of the Month. So that's exciting. And um, it is, it, it's a debut adult crime thriller, but by no means not Kate's first novel. So she's the author of a YA series, I'm Still Alive, Rules for, maybe not a series. Let me start over again. <laughs> I Am Still Alive, Rules for Vanishing, Our Last Echoes. She's also written Secrets of Eden Eld, is that correct? For middle grade, and then a couple of buried Regency romances I found out over alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but but I actually love Regency romances, so maybe I can coax her to read a draft copy. Anyway, I found out that you have at least one YA reader in the audience, but she wasn't aware of that over there. Wave your hand. Um, did she? That you, I mean, she's not here because of your YA books, but she really likes YA books. So I wanted to ask you, before we talk about what lies in the woods, since you have written a number of books for different age groups, how does that change your writing, depending on which audience you're writing for? I adore writing for different age groups. And uh, I started out writing, intending to write only for adult. And then uh, I wrote I Am Still Alive mostly not because I necessarily wanted to write YA, but because I wanted to write this particular story, which was kind of a love letter to my favorite survival stories growing up. And getting into that uh, headspace and writing about a character who was figuring out who she was and coming of age, uh, that was a lot of fun. And so uh, I was happy to dive into a young adult career and then the next thing that I picked up was uh, middle grade, which for me is like a breath of fresh air every time. My middle grades are kind of spooky and very funny. And they're these adventures that are always uh, uh, fun and lighthearted, but then also they really taught me to dive really deep into emotion and sincerity because my instinct often before that was to keep myself out of remove from my writing and have kind of that cynical emotional distance. And you can't do that and write a 12 year old who feels real. You know, her, your character's emotions just fill them completely. And so that really taught me to tap into something new. And uh, I, middle grade remains the only category where I can make myself cry writing a book mm. uh, and then also they are the most you know lighthearted and funny and they're always a nice break from the darkness of the other ones uh, and returning to writing adult uh, it has a lot in common with writing my young adult stuff it's certainly more similar than the middle grade but the, what I like to joke is that with older characters, there's just a lot more time to pack in a lot more damage. <laughs> and if you're writing a 17-year-old who's loved and lost, you know, it happened in the last couple of years. And with adult characters, you just have more time to build up scar tissue and to think about uh, how someone has changed or what, uh, how they've become set in their ways. And so there's just a different dynamic you have to work with, uh, with the way that characters interact with the world and each other. Uh, and so I enjoy that I can really tap into themes in adult, uh, uh, the adult category about uh, our, the depth of history in an individual and secrets from the past to a much more intense degree. And if I'm looking to do similar themes in young adult, for instance, I'd be more likely to reach for like a generational secret or something uncovered in the past that didn't 
directly involve the main character. And so just being able to play with different themes across all of the, the categories is also something that keeps me wanting to write in all of them and never give up on any of them. <laughs> oh, why should you? You know, way back, I was kind of naive and I thought that language might be the choice of, you know, how people spoke might be a differential. But it seems to me like wh from what you're saying, it's a choice of themes and stories that really differentiates YA from adult fiction. So do you, do you actually change, you know, the, the language that you use when you go from one to another? The voice certainly changes, and uh, just naturally by entering a different voice, my vocabulary will shift and my mm. standard sentence structure will shift. But I don't consciously uh, go like, oh, a kid won't know that word most of the time. Uh, I might occasionally uh, rephrase something because it's in a, very, a very adult phrasing, mm -hmm. Uh, but I try to put a lot of faith in my younger readers, and I remember one of my favorite things to do was to look up words that I didn't know and be very proud of myself <laughs> for knowing words that maybe uh, other people my age didn't know. Um, you know, I was that kid who was like, I know what a gibbous moon is. <laughs> Uh, so I don't spend too much time consciously thinking about the word-by-word -word language, but there is a degree to which it just naturally flows when you enter that voice. So writing adult books, most of them seem to arrive at kind of a standard length. I mean, you know, somewhere between 300 and 400 is pages is kind of normal. Are young adult stories shorter in general, or does it really matter? Uh, there is a lot of variation, but certainly for mine, uh, the young adult ones, I usually try to keep them under 90,000 words for my supernatural horror, which does require a little bit more room for world building and things like that. Uh, and then for something, um, for, uh, like, I Am Still Alive, I think clocks in at um, 82,000, something like that. So they're a little zippier, but not outside the same range as yeah. adult. No, it's not, because there are a lot of adult mysteries that are actually shorter than that, or mm -hmm. no more, more, more than that. What about the pace? Do you find that you need to have more action or less dialogue in young adult? Uh Young adult tends to be an interesting blend of <laughs> zippier in some ways and, and more of the action, more dialogue. But then, uh, you know, you want those moments of real, uh, just absolute throw yourself into introspection for the characters because uh, being a teenager is a very dramatic emotional time. <laughs> and so you can blow up those feelings in a moment to a degree that would, you know, maybe even seem melodramatic if it was a 30-year-old. But like when you're 16, that's just the way it is. Right. And so uh, it definitely moves quicker on its feet most of the time, but that isn't to say that there aren't uh, moments of introspection and really diving to the interiority of the character. Just so you know, publishers tend to make 18 the break point between young adult and adult fiction. But obviously, there are 18-year-olds that, you know, can read at a much higher level and 18-year-olds that really are reading at a much lower level. So it's just arbitrary. Um, and I've never quite worked out exactly. But I think there's plenty of young adult reads that we can read, you know, as grown-ups and really enjoy them. Um, I'm not sure if it works entirely the other way, but I like to think, I mean, when I was like, in fifth grade, I had read my way through the entire library at my school, so I dove into Edith, no, to Bullfinch's mythology. I'm a walking encyclopedia about Greek mythology because, you know, there wasn't anything else left in the library for me to read. Oh, hi, you're back. <laughs> and uh, look, my favorite fan is here. So come on, cutie, come and show us because you've had a haircut. Do you all remember her when she had a lot more fur? But she has this great top knot. Okay, there go the dogs. <laughs> Anyway, it's nice to see you back. Thank you. Right, so here we are talking about What Lies in the Woods, which is your, is it for your first published adult thriller as opposed yeah. to adult fiction? Absolutely. Okay. That, that's the, the most precise way to put it. <laughs> All right. So what, what does thriller mean to you? You know, when they talk about it as a thriller, what does that mean? 
Uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think mostly it means that that's the the label that we uh, put on it that will help the people who will like it the best to find it. Um, I think the definition of thriller has uh, moved and changed and expanded uh, over the years. And uh, certainly it's uh, a blend of both mystery and thriller, but maybe has a bit more of a uh, present threat to it than a strict uh, classic mystery. Um, and for me, the types of thrillers that I read and that inspired me to write, what I'm interested in is the uh, intense character study of them and the diving into uh, psychology and the reasons behind people uh, making some questionable choices and the sense that the main character is also holding some secrets of their own. Uh, and those elements that really raise the tension are what draw me to thrillers. Gotcha. So most of the time when I think about thrillers, I think that the really great ones rise and fall on the villain. So if you think about Silence of the Lambs, how many of you actually think about Clarice Starling as compared to Hannibal Lecter, right? Because, I mean, he's a super evil guy. But in the sort of thriller that this book is and what we're calling the psychological suspense or thriller drama, you don't actually know who the villain is because part of the point of the book is to have all these interesting twists. So you're not sure who to trust. And in the end, you're going to be surprised if the author's done a good job. <laughs> you're going to be surprised by who the villain might be. So it's it's an interesting thriller in that, you know, you don't, it is not a straightforward for the reader contest between the hero and the bad guy, the bad actor. I think that that's one of the things that I love the most about modern uh, psychological thrillers is that uh, in sort of the Agatha Christie style mysteries, you want to find out a basic, you know, a motive uh, and then like solve the puzzle of how it was done. And in a thriller where you, uh, you know, it's one of these psychological thrillers, but you don't know who the villain is, what you're doing is really diving into what type of person each of these characters are and what parts of their personalities and backgrounds make them suspicious. And so you just have to not trust anyone. And it's more of a like constructing the mind of each of the characters to figure out which one of them would truly be devious enough to be the, the killer. I think, you know, it's an interesting genre. And I read one not long ago. Fortunately, I can't even remember the name of it, so I can't call it out. But it turned out that the main character lied all the way through to the reader. And that wasn't okay with me. That was a step too far for me. Um, it's all right, it seems to me, if you can kind of trust the main, you know, the main narrator and maybe not trust the other characters. And so you wonder, do you all, do you probably, none of you have read Mary Stewart, or maybe I'm making a false assumption here. Do any of you remember Mary Stewart? Ah, one over there, and a girl. So her basic design was she would have a heroine in a really fabulous place. Did you ever read Mary Stewart? I don't think so. Well, she was a huge bestseller back in the, what, 1960s and 70s and all, and her books are still in print. But she would always have a woman in a very exotic and beautiful place, like a chateau in France or on the island of Corfu or whatever it was. She was very good at describing landscape and nature writing and so forth. And there would always be two guys. There would always be two guys, and you never knew till you got to the end which guy was going to turn out to be the good guy and which guy was going to turn out to be the betrayer. Is that a reasonable description of them? Right, Nine Coaches Waiting is a is a classic. It's actually set in Victorian France, but that, that would be one. Or My Brother Michael, which is set in Greece. Anyway, she was actually writing a trust no one, but it wasn't the it wasn't the central character that you couldn't trust. It was, you know, the people out there. So it's not a completely new form, mm -hmm. but it really took off with Gone Girl. And now everybody and Girl on the Train and books like that. And, you know, now there's a whole passion for Stories mostly about women, although sometimes it can be men, right? But in your case, we've got three women who are really central to this story. Yeah, I um, for some reason I'm 
finding, uh, I'm realizing that I'm really drawn to trios in oh, my yeah. fiction. Uh, I keep returning to them, and especially for uh, things like this where uh, there are more questions about who you can trust and uh, more complicated and not purely positive friendships between people. Uh, I think it's because when you add a third friend to a really tight group, there's this inherent instability to it immediately. Because if you've got a pair of friends, you're friends or you're not friends. Like, you, you know, you're, you're getting closer, you're getting farther apart. If there's a conflict, it's between the two of you. When you add a third person, all of a sudden, if two of them have a conflict, it also affects the group dynamic. And there's a third mm. person who's invested in that relationship. And so instead of just having, you know, two poles and the relationship between them, you've got three sides and then the group relationship. And it instantly adds a level of complexity that means when you start, you know, chucking rocks in that pond, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get really dicey really fast. <laughs> Absolutely. So you've done an interesting thing because Naomi Shaw, who is the... Um, really point of view character, I guess we could call it, is is somewhat untrustworthy because she had a traumatic event, which um, Kate can tell you about, a traumatic event, and she doesn't remember it maybe as it actually was. So she's not deliberately untrustworthy, but she actually may be untrustworthy because her memories may be false. Mm -hmm. I think it's very tricky to write an unreliable narrator and have it be honest <laughs> between the author and the reader. Right. You have to stick to whatever promise you're making about the kind of the degree of unreliability that the reader is signing up for. And so for Naomi, she's never going to lie in her narration to the reader, but she is aware that she's not a reliable narrator because she can't trust her own memories. And so she also can't rely on herself. Right. And that's the kind of unreliable narrator that I'm, I'm personally more interested in writing um, because I like to uh, kind of be able to be in the on on the side of the reader in a way mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't like uh, trying to mislead the reader as the author I would like to mislead them through the events of the story well I mean Naomi isn't lying to us. You know, she we know from the outset that she doesn't necessarily remember um, events. And why don't we talk about what the events are that have led to the situation that arises? You want to give us your pitch for the book? Sure. Uh, so <laughs> What Lies in the Woods is the story of Naomi and her two best friends who find something in the woods uh, that uh, they really should tell an adult about. And instead, they decide to make this discovery the center of what they call the goddess game, which is this game of fantasy that is their sort of last ditch attempt as they're aging to hold on to the magic of their friendship and their childhood. And so they hide this body that they found in the woods and don't tell anyone about it until uh, Naomi is attacked and uh, stabbed and miraculously survives. And they are able to identify a man as the attacker and put him in prison. And it turns out that he is suspected of being a serial killer. So all of a sudden, they're heroes. And it's very important because the police couldn't get him for these murders that their uh, testimony be unimpeachable. And so they realize they can't tell anyone now about this other thing that they were doing in the woods because then that would make their testimony suspect and people would turn on them. So they agree 
never to speak of it. And then 20 years later, this man dies in prison, and Olivia, one of Naomi's friends, says it's time to tell people. And so they all return to their hometown to decide what to do about uh, Olivia's desire to come clean. Well, it's always a problem when there's a compact, you know, to keep a secret, and then one person wants to break it. Never goes well for that person, as a rule. I love the dedication. That's what I was searching for. This book is dedicated for all the wild girls who search for magic in the woods. That's really a nice dedication. I couldn't remember it verbatim, so I looked it up. So, you know, you are talking about really kind of the magic of childhood or the, you know, possibly imaginary world of childhood running full tilt into reality mm -hmm. as adults. Yeah, it's, uh, it's inspired in large part by my own childhood. And uh, I had in elementary school two best friends and we had a very long running fantasy world uh, of our creation where magic was real and we would make potions and search for unicorns. <laughs> and we didn't believe in magic. You know, we were all pretty rational, skeptical kids, but we, at least I really wanted to. And I had this sense like, if I could believe, then maybe it would be possible that it was real. And so I tried to believe so hard. And we had an unspoken rule that you we didn't talk about it like it was a game. We always talked about it like it was real and it was just something that we knew about, that we were discussing and that we were learning new things about. And the, the power of that longing and that shared reality is what I wanted to capture with Naomi's childhood. So she was only 11 when uh, she was left for dead in the woods outside this little northwest town called Chester. Um, and she, you, you haven't talked about the condition that she was in. Uh, yes, she was uh, stabbed 17 times, luckily fairly shallow wounds as she survived. Uh, and she was uh, presumed dead by her friends who ran to get help and then uh, rescued and became the miracle girl of Chester. Right. And therefore, there was some credibility in their testimony yeah. about the guy that, you know, was the serial killer or perhaps stabbed her. So then we fast forward to the small town. Small towns seem to work better for long buried secrets than, say, downtown Chicago. Um, um, you, you need to create your small town. Right. Even if you're in the big city, you need your, your small community right. who all know the secret and are, or, or are impacted by the secret and know the context of it. Otherwise, it just doesn't have as much power. <laughs> no, no, it definitely does not. So 22 years after Naomi, so she's now 33, if mm -hmm. I'm doing the math right here. Um, so he's died in prison, and uh, Naomi is sucked back to Chester because, what, Olivia wants yeah. to explore what Olivia they've agreed to keep secret all this time. What Olivia says at the end of the first chapter is, I did something. I found Persephone. And that means that she thinks she knows who it is that they found. And she wants to. So, but this is in go. addition to Naomi. So you have two things that actually happen. You have Naomi with 17 stamp woods mm -hmm. in the woods. But then there was something else in the woods at the same time. Yes, there was, there was Persephone, their magic talisman that they uh, made the, the center of their game. So Persephone goes with calling it the goddess game. That's right. Do you all know who Persephone was? <laughs> Everybody? No? You want to <laughs> describe Persephone? She's a Greek goddess. Yes. Remember I said <laughs> I already knew all how to do that, right? Uh, Greek goddess, uh, the She's young the girl brought down to the underworld yeah. to be Hades' bride. Right. She's the daughter of Ceres, also called Demeter, who is really the goddess of the harvest in um, you know, the person who made it possible for people to have food and to eat. And so when Persephone went down into Hades, it created a situation of winter, not just summer, all the time. And there was an effort to bring her back 
And the eventual arrangement was that she did come back to her mother part of the year so that spring and summer then flourished and nobody starved to death. But she's a, she's a really pivotal character in terms of the seasons and agriculture and all that good stuff. And what happens with the girls is that they're already playing this game that they've deemed the goddess game, and they've gin given themselves goddess names and said that their uh, the, their game for the summer is that they're going to do seven rituals to uh, honor the goddesses and call on them and sort of have one last shot at this sense of a magical summer. And then they find uh, a body a skeleton, and uh, around the skeleton's wrist is one of those little alphabet bracelets that says Persephone. And ah. they take that as a sign that this is here for them and that they were meant to find it. And so that's what in really kind of pushes them over the edge to keeping her to themselves because clearly she's their secret. I love the woods. The woods is often, you know, kind of a metaphor for a lot of things. Or we had a woods outside my grade school when I was a kid in Winnetka, Illinois. There was a, a meadow that had a little creek going through it and eek snakes. And then there was a patch of actual woods. There was still a forest preserve around Chicago. And, you know, it was a really tame woods. But for us, when we were little kids, it was big and scary and dark. And nobody wanted to be there after dark. And so I really can understand, you know, the power so often in fairy tales and other things, it's into the woods, right? Mm -hmm. Tana French, do you remember any of you read Tana French? Her first book is called The Woods, right? And Harlan Coben has written two books where it's all about people in the woods. So there's, I think it's kind of a leftover from, you know, when the world was more forested and there were bears and wolves and, you know, really scary things in the woods, maybe goblins and other stuff. And when you're a kid, you know, that's all more real to you. Right. So let's talk about the podcaster, because true crime podcasting has become a thing in crime fiction. It has become, it's almost replacing the private eye, because private eye jobs have become, uh, you know, digital to a large extent. They're not really, you know, the kind of adventurous private eye novels that, let's say, Raymond Chandler wrote about, where they, they did stuff. So true crime podcaster, what interested you about him? His name is Ethan. Well, I knew that I needed someone to uh, kind of be a busybody. <laughs> and uh, the I think the traditional thing would be the private eye or a reporter. But I think one of the really attractive things about podcasters as characters is that you you when there's a reporter from a newspaper, you know that they <laughs> they're a professional. They have a job. They have someone they answer to. And anyone can say they're a podcaster and start asking nosy questions, uh, you know, and they can even have a professional sounding podcast if they have the money to buy a good mic uh, and, you know, they have a, a good voice for it. So you don't know what you're getting at all. Uh, and, uh, you know, and also just it's so popular now through crime and podcasting that there are a lot of people who uh, are asking questions and putting together stories who you don't necessarily have the ability to look into their references and their backgrounds. And so that little added uh, bit of uh, that Ethan could show up on the scene without being accountable to anyone but himself, uh, and that fits in well <laughs> with not really knowing who to trust and having to make your own judgments. So it seemed like a good fit for that role of the uh, person showing up and asking questions and forcing her to uh, talk about things that she hasn't talked about in a very long time. Well, and you know, unless he's a particularly wealthy podcaster, they're always looking to monetize, you know, because there has to be some way to pay the bills for all that. So that adds a layer of, you know, we're not sure we can trust because, you know, how much of it. We've talked so much over the last few years about the media being so addicted now, you know, to clicks, to shock value, because that's what draws eyeballs to the, that's why a few people, currently Prince Harry, formerly our <laughs> president, um, you know, kept drawing 
everybody to the media because it was always sensational and you know you always got extra attention eyes on clicks whatever it is so um you know true crime podcasters i mean some of them may be invested initially following the story and really coming to the conclusion but they also have to figure out who's paying for it mm -hmm. so what's ethan's game can we even talk about it <laughs> uh well ethan uh, shows up saying that he is doing a podcast that is about the serial killer who was in prison uh, and he uh, he has approached uh, Naomi's friends but not Naomi herself yet to ask questions about uh, what happened to her and about their testimony and he starts to throw some doubt on her testimony and ask some questions that she really doesn't want to think about the answers to because she's not certain of them herself. And she's worried that she put the wrong man in prison. And so who are the two friends? We haven't even, yeah, I mean, we've uh, mentioned Olivia briefly, but well, who's Cass? Cass and Olivia were... Uh, they're sort of on opposite sides of the town as kids. It's a logging town, and Olivia's parents are um, uh, basically environmentalists. And so they're not super popular in a dying industry logging town. Uh, and Cass is the daughter of the mayor. And so they're, like, not supposed to be friends. And so Cass immediately is like you're going to be my best friend and Naomi happens to sit in between them <laughs> and yeah. so the three of them end up best friends from kindergarten and Cass is kind of the ringleader of the group and she's the one that will um you know when everyone's going what do you want to do I don't know what do you want to do Cass is like we're going to do this uh, and so she is a little bit more the spine of the group, and she also becomes the caretaker of the group after uh, her friends kind of fall apart as teenagers. Um, and Naomi credits her with uh, getting Naomi through high school and out of Chester in one piece uh, because she just sort of... Um, bullies them into going to school and getting dressed and doing their homework. And so she's taken on this very, like, I'm the one that's put together and, uh, you know, I'm kind of the mom friend role. And now she's the, the one of them who is outwardly very successful and she runs the lodge outside of town and has her own life that she's fought very hard to construct in a particular way and really doesn't want anything to disrupt it. And we dealt with all that unpleasantness. <laughs> it was terrible and we all survived it and things are good now. So why would we upset things again? And then Olivia has struggled a lot more in the time since she was um, kind of the more shy bookish friend. Uh, and she and Naomi had been, um, a little bit closer to each other around that time. And uh, sh afterwards, she uh, falls apart in her own way. And she's living back home with her parents and has never been able to move on fully and make a full life for herself in the way that the other two have. And so she's the one that has never stopped wondering if they should have kept that secret and hasn't stopped kind of picking at that scab. So Cass and Olivia are, are in Chester. Naomi, who left, is drawn back into this story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's always interesting, too, when one person's away and then returns, and things aren't the same as when they left, which is, you know... So that, that also creates some interesting stuff. We're not going to be able to say anything more because we're going to spoil the book for you. <laughs> There's um, a lot of interesting things that happen, but you have to remember this trio um, and the circumstances um, by which they were both bonded and then, you know, it's festered among them all this time to a greater or lesser degree. 
but obviously the book is going to turn on what happens when they all get back together and the secret kind of bubbles up, right? Nothing bad happens. Mm. It's all fine. <laughs> yeah, right. No, don't believe her. She's an unreliable <laughs> narrator right over there. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's a really interesting. The characters are great. Um, it's very well written. And I think, I don't know, you know, do you think you could have written this book if you hadn't written all these other books? This particular book? I mean, oh you know, there's you, everybody... Yeah. As, as you develop your craft, you know, things things can change or whatever it is. Could you have written this book at the outset? No, absolutely not, uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, my writing has changed and grown with every new story that I've taken on. Uh, I wouldn't have thought to write this book uh, before my first uh books started to come out uh, with every book I have learned something new that interests me and I've found an a avenue of character or theme that I have only been able to touch on in this book and I want to make it the focus of the next book or my research for a book has led me to a new subgenre or a piece of nonfiction that has just put a new story into my head. I think every single book that I've written, published or unpublished, has been a, a building block towards what I'm working on now. Well, I'm happy to say that this book has had enormous reviews, very positive reviews, and a tough January when there have been at least four or five really hotly promoted first novels. And uh, for a couple of people, genuinely a first novel. For you, this is your first adult thriller, so there's just this little faint distinction. But nonetheless, um, you know, I, I, it's hard to make noise in a, in a crowded room. It and, is, yeah. you know, good for you that you have done that. I haven't read <laughs> you some of the quotes, but they've been wonderful. She has a starred review. Um, her publisher is very enthusiastic about this book and put a lot of energy into it. So are you feeling really good about it? I am. Uh, it's been just marvelous watching uh, the response and uh, seeing the good trade reviews come in and having so much uh, support and enthusiasm from the team at Flatiron, too. Uh, my editor, Christine, is just fantastic and uh, <laughs> very smart <laughs> and was able to pinpoint all of the places in the book where uh, you know we needed to dial up the tension a little bit more and all of that. Uh, working with her has been amazing. Uh, and then just everyone who's touched it at Flatiron has done just a wonderful job promoting it and getting it into people's hands. And then uh, the early response from readers has been so gratifying to see. Um, I try not to pay too much attention to uh, reviews and all of that because uh, you can kind of drive yourself crazy that way, trying to track every number ticking up. But uh, it's been very exciting. And, uh, well, it sets a high bar. You know, it can be scary to try to live up to it. But, you know, in a way, since you, you actually have published earlier books, but does this feel like a debut all over again? It does in a lot of ways. You know, it's my first adult thriller. Um, it's my first adult novel under my name, um, which is uh, its own thing. And um, uh, it's it's been nerve wracking and exciting in a way that uh, my young adult debut was, but uh, not many books have been since, especially, you know, in the depths of the pandemic when I wasn't able to come out and do events and meet people. And so it's felt like a renewal in a lot of ways and um, uh, back to being a <laughs> shiny debut in, in some aspects. So what are you working on? I'm always like to leave people with the idea that, you know, you've got something cooking away for us next time. Uh, well, I'm always cooking away at a lot of things, but since this is for What Lies in the Woods, I'll focus on my next adult thriller, uh, which is, uh, it has some similar themes. It has another trio, but this time they are sisters, and uh, when they were teenagers, their parents were killed. 
And the book opens with the parents dead in the house and the middle daughter, uh, the middle sister looking at her younger sister and her older sister who have various suspicious things going on about them. And she says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Ooh. And then 25 minutes later, they call the police. <laughs> and uh, the, that is the main character, the middle sister, who ends up being suspected of the crime, but never speaks up about what she saw. And uh, many years later, uh, returns to the family home and decides that she's done keeping quiet and uh, whatever it means for her sisters, she's going to find out what happened. That's almost like painting a cross on your back, right? Making <laughs> yourself a target when you do that. Really interesting. So do any of you want to know about her writing process? Is that a subject of interest? Okay, so why don't you give us a little clue about your writing process for What Lies in the Woods? Uh, is it different than your other? Sorry, is it different than your other writing process? All of my writing follows like similar broad strokes. Uh, I really love developing ideas. Uh, if that was, if I could get paid to just like develop ideas all day, I would, I would be happy to do that. Um, so I usually come up with like half a dozen books that I could write before I hit on the one that, oh, actually, you know, there's a lot of meat on, on those bones. Like I can make something of that. So I will spend a lot of time um, kind of writing a general pitch, a general premise, and then just filling notebooks with free writing about it. Who would the characters be? What do I think is really going on? What are the themes here? Uh, and when the answers start to feel like they are the right ones and not just a possibility in a list of possibilities, that's when it starts to feel real. Like, oh no, that, that is the, the version of this story that I would want to write. Um, and at that point, uh, I will develop it until I have um, not really an outline, but what I like to think of as signpost scenes. I tend to think in terms of the major moments that I want in the book, whether that's uh, a major loss or a reveal or a partic particular twist. And I think of them in terms of, of sort of the mood and the reaction in the reader that I want. And so I, I create those signposts as um, just like bullet points. And I come up with an ending uh, and I try to figure out the ending enough so that if I get to the end and that's still the ending, it'll work great. Uh, but I accept that often I'll get to the ending and the book has changed enough that that is no longer the ending. Uh, and then I just um, sort of dive in and there are usually three or four points along the way where I hit a dead stop and um, it used to be that I would push through it and you know, just write that messy first draft. But I've realized now that the reason that I stop is almost always because there is something wrong in what I've written already, and I've now written enough to see it. So I usually have pretty set points of like a third of the way through and halfway through where I go through and do a revision. And uh, then I just push through to the end. Um, I'm pretty systematic about things. I try to work on one thing at a time and not really take breaks until I have it because I'm, <laughs> I'm very impatient with drafting. It's not my favorite part at all. I really love revising. So I just want to get through it so that I can get to the fun part of fixing things. <laughs> Uh, that's so that yeah, a, that makes a lot of sense. That's Are you a reader? Process. Were you, you know, a reader growing up? Were you? <laughs> yeah, uh, we. Um, while I'm on this trip, I bought my six-year-old son a stack of chapter books to entertain him while he's. Uh, my my mom was watching him, but she has to work during the day. So I was like, read these books. Don't bother her. And she's like, he read them in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and. I was the same way. At one point, 
uh, we asked my dad if we could go to the bookstore and he said, why don't I buy you a candy bar? It'll last longer, <laughs> no. which he's never lived down. So we always gobbled down books and um, any kind or anything in particular. Uh, I was very focused on science fiction and fantasy all the way through mm. high school. I read almost nothing else. Uh, and it was only in college that I realized that other books existed <laughs> and I got into thrillers and things like that. So, uh, you know, I read Narnia and Lord of the Rings and uh, uh, Mercedes Lackey and Anne McCaffrey and anything with a dragon on it, anything <laughs> with a unicorn on it. I right. was there. So Peter Beagle, The Last Unicorn. Absolutely. One of my favorite <laughs> books. Right. A beautiful book. I, I actually think I read, appreciated it a lot yeah, more as an adult than I, I read did as the a kid. the Lord of the Rings in college, which and also, um, sorry, the Sword in the Stone. Hi, isn't she great? She's back. Yeah. <laughs> um, any of you had that experience where you fell into? I know Marie Benedict, who I'm going to talk to Monday about the Mitford affair on Zoom. Um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was like the seminal experience of her, you know, childhood reading. She said, who didn't love falling into Narnia, you know, with his family and going on those adventures and all. So any of you have a similar experience? Any particular book that you fell in love with and got you going? Come on, speak up. You don't need to be shy. No? With me, it was the Oz books. I was absolutely enslaved to the Oz books. I started reading when I was very, very young. When I got to be 10, I realized one day that I was never going to go to Oz, and that was the moment in which I understood death and growing up, <laughs> that I would never, ever cross the deadly desert. I would never get to meet, you know, Tiger and oh, the Hungry Tiger and uh, Cowardly Lion and all the rest of it. So fantasy, I think, for children can be so real. It's hard to, you know, distinguish between fantasy and the real world. Is that true for you as well? When you read Narnia, for example, did you think you might actually oh. go in through the wardrobe? I yeah, did. I mean, that's the one that I was always looking for was the the magical portal in the wardrobe or, uh, you know, a, a door in the woods. I always would, like, double check if there was a pair of trees that were standing, like, at a particular distance apart from each other. Like, just maybe if you walked between those, you'd end up in a fantasy world. <laughs> Because there's a, the barriers between the real world and the fantasy world are much reduced when you're a child. You're willing to cross over them if you can. So, yeah, it's interesting. I think people who read fantasy make wonderful novelists because, you know, there's nothing really beyond your range. Patrick, are there any questions from the audience, that virtual audience? Toad from Toad Hall? Mm -hmm. Did you ever read Watership Down? I never could quite make it with the rabbits. That was yeah? my very favorite was book. <laughs> yes. Let's see. Um, there were a couple of people that were on here as well. Uh, let's see. Who, who in my childhood took our road to Disney? Oh, that's a good one. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Ask her if she can define that better. Joe, we need you to tell us more about the good master. Do you know, I remember when I was at a, concert, a conference at, at Oxford, Val McDermott, who really is a very tough crime writer, writes very realistic things, suddenly introduced me to the chalet school girls. <laughs> I, you remember, I mean, I remember like the Bobsy twins, you know, that kind of thing. But for British girls, the chalet school was the deal. And I think... I think it was like children sent off to Switzerland, you know, for some kind of schooling. They always had fabulous adventures and, you know, that kind of thing. That was wonderful. Uh, okay, Joe, I also have a question for you. Do you ever go back to any published work and uh, think about rewriting it or just revisit any of that stuff? I've certainly thought about it, and uh, I leave the possibility open for the future. But right now, most of the unpublished work that I have is in other genres. Um, so I have an unpublished romance novel and a couple of uh, unfinished fantasy novels. And um, 
the the one that's the closest to finished actually has just like a little bit at the end where I know what I need to do to revise it and I just haven't done it partly because I revised it too many times and kind of broke myself and the book and it's just overworked but also because I realized that I really wanted to write that book but I didn't have a vision for writing another fantasy book and another one after that and I wanted to build a, uh, a career in a genre that I wanted to work in for a long time and so uh, it didn't make sense for me to put that much uh, time and um, mental energy into something that I viewed as kind of a one-off. So I still love that book and I would still love to go back to it and the others someday. But uh, until I have the, uh, the space to indulge myself with some one-offs, I think that they're going to stay in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have to do in your job that's so stressful that you feel like you're just like uh, well I moved away <laughs> and so there was kind of a uh, clean break there and when I moved away we were still of an age where um, uh, we had started uh, playing that particular game less but it hadn't entirely gone away and it maybe felt more like a game of pretend than it used to be but we hadn't entirely abandoned it and then uh, I moved across the country and I think that that might be part of why it stuck with me so much is that that uh, it became not just this time of uh, magic, but like I had left the magical world, and maybe I could get back to it someday. Anybody else? Anybody in the room here have a question they'd like to ask? Oh, uh, I am now going to forget every book I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, I have read some really beautiful young adult books recently, um, uh, and uh, there's uh, She is a Haunting is coming out this year, and it is just beautifully written, gorgeous, very scary, uh, and um, oh, what was the other one I wanted to mention? I had an answer prepared and I'm, I'm sorry I'm so bad whenever anyone asks me to remember books um, uh, it will come to you it will at nine o'clock yes <laughs> at just, nine o'clock tonight uh, I yeah. will text you okay and get back and, online and I can repeat <laughs> turn the camera on oh, I can't <laughs> no but I can stick it in an e-news yes Yeah, I definitely think that I will. Um, uh, the I'm starting to play around with ideas for the next next book, and that's one of the things that you know it's time to break out of that mold and start uh, thinking about. Uh, you know, there there's also so much potential in the friendships you make as an adult because there's just so much you don't know about the person and uh, so many years before you came along and you don't know who they used to be necessarily uh, and there can be you know a very fun process of discovery or it might be completely irrelevant or it might turn out that there are some skeletons in their closet uh, so it's it's a different dynamic they both have a ton of narrative potential and i think that uh, I tend to go through uh, sort of phases in 
the types of themes that I like to pick at. And so I'm moving through this phase, but I think that the, the next one, I'm very interested in that very question. I wanted to add Delicious Monsters by LaSalle Sambury was the other one that I wanted to mention that uh, I have had the pleasure of reading an early version of. Uh, also very beautifully written, uh, very deep characterization and uh, one of the most truly scary young adult horror novels I've read recently. Well, you really like scary, don't you? I do like scary. Uh, um, one of our, um, you know, little family quips about me when I was little is that I said of movies, we yike the scary parts. <laughs> I absolutely want to someday, uh, but for somewhat similar reasons as putting the fantasy back on the shelf, I don't want to confuse my readers too much. So right now they are somewhat siloed from each other. I write the supernatural YA, but uh, I'm, I'm really focused on the non-supernatural thriller side in adult for the foreseeable future. But um, I describe myself as a bit of a magpie writer. I see something shiny and I want to write it. So uh, I would not <laughs> take anything off the table for the future. <laughs> if you like that kind of book, we just got Grady Hendrix's How to Sell a Haunted House in autographed copies, <laughs> right? So um, Grady and I did an event together for Jason Rickolek, who, do you remember the name? I'm Hidden Pictures. Thank you, Hidden Pictures, which is one of my totally favorite books for last year. And part of it, I don't know, were you familiar with it, Kate? I haven't read it yet, but I want to. Well, one of the things that's so amazing about it is that it uses illustrations as part of the narrative mm -hmm. voice. The, the voice of the child is actually the pictures that she draws. And as you move through the book and the artwork changes, and the mm -hmm. final revelation of who she is is through a picture. It's really... Did you, I, wasn't I it great? I such such a, a weakness for anything that uses like mixed media and right. um, artwork. It's just it's just an amazing book. And while I don't I can't remember if it actually hit the New York Times list. I get an Excel sheet every week because we report to the Times of all the there's like fifty books that they're looking for to keep track of, you know, whatever it all is. And that book has mm -hmm. been on that Excel sheet for months. It's never really I can't remember if it actually made it into the top ten. It might have. Sorry, Grady. You're probably going to hear about this. Um, <laughs> I can't remember if it made it into the print list or if it did for very long, but it has never dropped off. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing they're looking for is just kind of one of those really fabulous books that's done really well but not necessarily super well, which is a curse. But if you have not read it, Hidden Pictures is just is magnificent. It really is. And such an interesting way of telling a story. You know, it's mixed because the adults are talking like adults, you know, but the child is speaking through her pictures. That's very cool. It really is. It's just <laughs> great. that up to the top of right. the list. <laughs> Um, I naturally gravitate more towards standalones. I've done the the only true series I've done was in middle grade, and uh, I I don't think that I would uh, reach for that in adult because the real pleasure in writing for me in in young adult and in adult is uh, developing a new character and getting to know them and building their world. And uh, I don't necessarily want to keep following them. I want to be able to uh, pack all of the suffering into one book <laughs> and then leave them behind. <laughs> if you do it that way, everyone in the book is at risk all the time. Yes, that's There's true, no yeah. safety net for the characters. And in the series, the one person who survives is the series character, right? And uh, also with my habit of making big changes as I draft my way through a book, I would definitely worry about 
uh, kind of writing myself into a corner and not knowing how to get out of it because I couldn't just go back and change the first book. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, if it's something that sometimes happens if you are uh, changing and revising a book uh, over and over again. And for me, what that looks like is that I stopped being able to see what made the book good, uh, and I lost my uh, internal sense of what the core of the book was and why I was writing it. And I had changed so many things in it. It was, it also just reaches a level of mental load where I'm keeping track of all of the different versions there have been. And wait, in this one, does he have an uncle or not? And did this character die in this chapter in this way or not? Uh, and so there's, there's like, um, just a practical level on which it becomes more work to get back into it. And then also it starts to look like gobbledygook. Yeah, yeah. and, um, and I, I lost the joy of it. And it, it was a fantasy heist. It was supposed to be a fun, clever romp with very um, irreverent characters and, you know, and a lot of heart and uh, it just felt like a slog at that point, and I couldn't, um, I couldn't find the fun in it anymore, and I couldn't write that book if I didn't have a sense of fun. The, it just turned into plodding, and so um, I knew that I had to walk away from it, and I had walked away from it and um, started over so many times that this had been my, like, I'll give it one more chance. <laughs> And uh, at that point, I was just burned out on it, and I couldn't, I couldn't see its heart anymore, so I couldn't fix it. So we had an event. Patrick was here for it with Peter Blauner, um, who, has, who finally has published a book that has taken him over 20 years to finally figure out what the story should be and how to tell it. I mean, it had version. Remember, he talked about it, version after version after version. But the magic part is that he's finally published it at the right time to publish it. And if, in fact, he had published it 20 years ago, it would not have worked. Yeah. So there's hope for you <laughs> in that, you know. You no, I mean, I'm not deleting it. No, you know, but I'm I mean, it may be I that. I still have so much affection for that book. <laughs> but it may be that it's just not its time yet, you know, for you to tell that story. But yeah, you shouldn't and give I it up. That there were some things about it that I just wasn't a good enough writer yet to mm. have uh hit the note properly and that was part of why I kept having to go over it over and over again and so if I come back to it in five years you know every book I have learned something new so maybe I will have learned the thing that I need to shock some life back into it Jeffrey Deaver hang by his knees from a trapeze <laughs> over the press I know it's such a great image <laughs> of the spontaneity and the joy. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. No, I, th I think, you know, I think stories have to find their time. And maybe it's just not yet your time for that particular book. Yeah, I think that's the case. I hope that I get the chance to wander back to it someday and we can be friends again. <laughs> well, we'll see. But you're clearly a person who lives to write. And so, you know, you'll keep on writing. Yep. Anything else before we wind up? All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you, online audience. We really appreciate your watching it. And we do have autographed copies. We have some left. This is our January Crime Collector's Book of the Month. Um, so most of it's gone, but there are a few copies left. Thank you all very much for coming out tonight and joining us. If you'd like to get your book signed or talk to Kate, um, we'll do that. So bye, everybody. <laughs> Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them 
and your help would be appreciated, please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.